Have you ever been too hot or too cold in your building or a bit of both? The answer is MEP, so stick around and we'll explain what that means. But first, before I introduce our guest, don't forget to like and subscribe. So today we're talking to Lucy from Siska. She's a mechanical engineer. Welcome, Lucy. Hi, Todd. Great to be here. So what's it all about? What is an MEP engineer? So, Todd, so you say, is, is it too hot, too cold in a building? Um, it goes deeper than that. People um, need to be comfortable in the building. So it's also about fresh air, um, lighting levels, um, humidity levels. So MEP stands for M is the mechanical. So mechanical is all about the comfort, the heating, the cooling, the ventilation. Um, e is the electrical component, which is the power, the lighting, the data and fire alarm. And then the P is, is the plumbing. So making sure you've got enough hot water, um, enough pressure um, and, and also about drainage and, and fire protection. And so, so people don't really notice those things, but they're, they're super important. They, they are indeed. Um, I, I feel like we're sort of quite far down, far down the food chain in terms of building design, um, but they're very important facets to a building. And MEP often goes very under the radar. Um, I, I didn't realise MEP consultants existed when I was younger. Um, but yeah, it's, it's all working in tandem with the structural engineer, the, the, the architect to, to, to make a really great building. So in regards to the architects, what do you wish an architect knew about an MEP engineer? Um, today we're going to focus a little bit more on mechanical given that's your background, but what do you wish an architect knew? So I, I don't want to overgeneralize and I've worked with a lot of fantastic architects, um, but sometimes it feels like we're a nuisance and the, the MEP is there to, to ruin the beautiful architecture. Um, we're often squeezed with, with, with ceiling voids and, um, and plant rooms, but um, as I say, it is fundamental to, to the operations of a successful building. We've got a lot of things to consider in terms of acoustics, making sure air isn't going too fast, um, plant is, 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 has got appropriate acoustic lining, etc. Um, we've got maintenance to be, to be aware of, so you can maintain the systems and they don't, they don't um, fall over very quickly. So I just wish architects um, would all across the board um, give us our space. <laughs> Um, and so they, they often want their um, nice spaces to be bigger and the plant spaces to be smaller. I, I understand that arm wrestles. So what about general contractors? What do you wish a general contractor knew about MEP engineering? So I think, I think in my experience, um, general contractors are very, very savvy to MEP. Their, their MEP trades are very important, uh, important trades in the construction process. I mean, I would say don't scrimp on the, the MEP trades. Make sure that they've got the right experience. There are a multitude of different systems. And so having the, the correct skill set is key. But always the problem, I mean, I've, I've been in the industry for 26 years now and always every project, we're going to leave enough time for commissioning and setting this system them up correctly and um, it, it always falls over that, that, that they're running late on program and then the, ME, the the commissioning time gets squeezed and the MEP is then not not set up properly and, and causes delays. Um, I don't know how to fix it. It's, it's, is it all the best will in the world? But it always, always happens. <laughs> My wife always says buy nice or buy twice. So you're, you're ad an advocate for uh, maybe the better mechanical engineering subcontractors and, and that's that's a good thing. So um, how would you summarize the role of an MEP engineer in construction? What do they do and why, why do they exist? So I think in the, come the construction phase, the role of the MEP consultant is to maintain the design intent. You forget before a contractor has been involved, who's going to deliver and build this amazing building or renovate this amazing building. The MEP consultant has, has spent, I don't know, depending on the size of the project, a year, two years, whatever, um, designing this, getting the best solutions. There's been lots of conversations, lots of decisions, um, stakeholders involved. Client, client decisions um, and there's reasons behind that. So it's making sure, it's difficult because the contractor 
typically comes on much later. It's making sure that design intent and the client um, expectations are met. Got it. So it's all about building comfort and managing different stakeholders from, from start to finish. So it's sort of, I'd be interested to know what the audience thinks, yes or no, about whether the, the buildings that you've finished and you've designed or you, you work in, are they too hot, too cold, or a bit of both? So, um, you know, let's focus on mechanical engineering. So where do you begin? You got a, a blank sheet of paper. How do you start a me mechanical engineering design? So, so something that I'm very passionate about is, is integrated design. We talk about MEP um, as the standalone trade, but actually, if you've got a blank sheet of a paper and a new build, where do you start? You start with the building orientation, the building massing, the shading, um, any any opportunities for natural ventilation. So you start with you start with that because you're then um, minim so that, that that's the architect, that's the whole design team. That's 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 where you start. Because you're then minimizing how much MEP you need to, to, to put into a building. And nowadays we have amazing software. Um, uh, we have amazing software that um, you can run algorithms to optimize daylighting versus solar gains, etc. So architects can overlay the aesthetics of their their, their building shading to, to 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 optimize that building design. It's really the very much the first the first port of call. The, the mechanical design comes comes further down the line and making sure that's sustainable. If you've got a a, a well positioned building. Um, that, that is definitely the first port of call. So architects are probably well educated. They understand that facing a building in a particular direction means they're going to get sunlight in, in, in a particular way. So uh, working with good architects is, is key as well. But, um, you know, maybe for our audience, you could talk through the basic. So what are the different pieces of the puzzle through um, HVAC? Okay, so of course, so H is, is, is the heating component. That's probably the most most straightforward. It's steady state loss calculation through the facade. So you've got um, a U value, the thermal transmittance of however well insulated your building is. Um, you've got an external um, temperature you're designing to dependent on where your building's located. Um, and then you've got an internal temperature you're trying to achieve. So that's quite a, a steady state calc. On top of that heating, you've got air tightness. So any, any air leakage, air infiltration. So that, that's heating. Um, ventilation, the V the V part is um, we have standards in terms of minimum amounts of fresh air you want to provide to, to the number of occupants in a building. And as we've seen with COVID, um, ventilation component is very important. And pe people are pushing to, to increase the, the ventilation rates abo above standards. Um, for, for not just for COVID, but there's been many studies in terms of um, behavior, cognizant behavior um, with, with more fresh air. Um, and then the AC is the, the air conditioning and air conditioning as a whole is is it can be heating as well as, as, as the cooling. Bit more tricky that the cooling calculation because you've got your internal heat gains, um, your your equipment, your lights, your computers, etc. Um, you've then got people um, who have a, a both a sensible and a lating heat gain um, component. And then you've got the facade. So you've got particularly solar heat gain um, on, on, on fenestration and, and glazing, um, which contributes to, to, to the heat load into a space. So what we do is we run dynamic models because you don't want to oversize plant. So when the sun's on one side of a building, it's not on the other side. Right. So you must make sure the equipment, you've got enough cooling to in the peak um, occurrence on every, every side of the building, but that's not going to happen concurrently. So you mm -hmm. make sure that the, the central plant is optimized for that that dynamic that dynamic peak um, cooling load scenario. Is that where load balancing comes into place? Yeah, no, absolutely. So it, exactly. So you just don't want to oversize your plant, and you don't add up the peak in every single quadrant. You add up the peak at one the, the peak load at one point of time in in the year. Which, but you then so then your plant is is optimally sized. You don't oversize your your cooling plant, um, so it can deal with the peak. But within the spaces, it's the, the plant is bigger. So if you added them all up, they wouldn't equate to the the total of the central cooling plant. Got it. And then so I, I challenge the audience to think the, the last time that they thought it was hot, maybe it was because there were a lot of people that came into the office. And so maybe you could write your comments in, in the uh, descriptions below and, and see if that was the reasons behind it. So 
talk to me about the central plant design. So now that you've got the building orientation sorted out, you understand the occupancy, uh, what's, what, what next with the central plant? So yeah, so there's there's many ways to, to heat and cool a building. There's there's different systems, steam, gas, electric. We're going obviously towards electrified solution. Um, I'm from the UK. You can probably tell by my accent, and and we decarbonized in um, in 2019. The industry wasn't prepared. We were still sort of um, designing um, gas-fired plant and equipment, and sort of hit us like a, like a ton of bricks. So I am sort of learning from that being here in the US. But so that's one factor. Thinking about the future and and, and what's going to happen. It's very difficult because we don't have a crystal ball, and we don't know when we're going to decarbonize. And there's a lot of opinions from a lot of people out there but another thing is, is exactly making sure your co concept is robust and you go through because once you've set a concept you sort of don't look back much really so it's making sure you go through your option here and you and you go through every option that you can possibly think of there's there's restrictions there's spatial restrictions um there's 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 cost restrictions there's there's client um goals um there's utility restrictions so um i think it's just making sure you go through the motions of looking at ev ev every possible feasible solution and and at cisco we've been looking at like Bearing in mind that decarbonisation is coming, we've been looking at um, uh, life cycle analysis. Right. So, because it, cost is obviously very important to clients, mm. and you can't just say, right, go electrified, and then it's going to cost them a fortune. Um, so, for example, a building I'm doing in, in downtown New York City, um, we had this blank canvas. Um, it's got steam there at the moment, but it's a completely blank canvas, completely um, has been um, gutted out. Um, so, we did life cycle analysis. What, what if we go all electric? It was extremely expensive. Um, right. What if we go all, all gas? Oh, it's much cheaper. So what we did is we then started looking at hybrids. So what we've ended up with at this particular project is a hybrid solution that is cost equivalent to all gas, but basically operates 70, 80 percent of the year in an all electric mode with with water source heat pumps. And then there's gas fired boilers that come on in the peak winter to, to lock that load. But the, in terms of the running costs and the and the, the capital cost, it works out financially. But it's also then a building that's very much ready for when we do decarbonize right. um, the gas, the gas fired boilers can be switched over whatever's um, acceptable in the future at that point whether that's electric boilers or I don't dare to say hydrogen boilers but that the, the system's there so I've really learned from the decarbonisation in, in UK where we were not prepared is think about the long haul and it. it's and very difficult to, tr to, to translate once you've um, once you've got a gas fired system in place. So we've got hybrid cars and now we've got hybrid buildings so I doubt the architects are going to give you extra space for what might happen in the future, right? So um, that's sort of a rhetorical question there. So what about the heating systems? You've touched on this before. At, for, for a general contractor or an owner, from a high level perspective, the, what are the variables and what makes it complicated for, for getting the buildings feeling comfortable for heating or cooling? So you've got people, computers, glazing so what how do you broadly speaking how do you calculate a heat load so we exactly we use we use software nowadays as there's various products on the market i mean we at cisco we use train trace we use ias and it's a dynamic model we model that building and we model the the, the facade and we mod so we, when, and you've got data where it's every hour the sun how it moves around so we model that and we model the the occupancy we model the the computers we model we model everything we have a, a calculation that then that then concludes what, what what that heat gain load is and how much cooling is required in each space for heating is it's the same you just I mean, putting heating coils in in the ducts or What's the difference? The heating is more straightforward because it's a steady state loss through, through, through a facade. The more insulated your facade is, um, you've got a, a better U value and you, you, you lose less heat. Got it. Um, that's, that is, 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 is more straightforward. Okay, so sw switching gears a bit, at the start we were talking about uh, you know, having good subcontractors. So what do you think makes a good mechanical subcontractor? What have you seen work well in the past or, or work not so well with the, the subcontractors? So, I mean, for me, it's about communication. 
um, we've got we've got all our RFIs and submittals and all these systems we now record um, that everyone's agreed to and signed up to and approved or whatnot. With, but I think the the main thing is, is communication. I think that's improved massively in the industry since I've been uh, in my past twenty five years in the industry. Um, communication is key. You're working with these people. Um, these teams have to be have to be really robust to have a successful project. Um, you can be working with them two, three, <laughs> four years. So I think that is um, going back to basics, communication. So it sounds simple, but I know that construction has so many different stakeholders and it's one of the most complicated industries in the world. So it's, it's important for communication. So um, what about roughing? So you, you've got the design happening, you've picked the, the subcontractor, um, you know, what's important at the rough-in stage um, when, you, when you're working with a subcontractor? How does the, the MEP engineering translate into the field? You know, what are the big ticket items to consider? Like, I think, it, again, it's about communication. Um, developing a good relationship where we can communicate openly and honestly um, is going to be much more effective than we're, if we're relying on, on, on paperwork um, and, and emails to get our point across. Um, as I said, there's there's always that need for the proper recording of actions, but just don't be reliant on that. Focus first on the good face-to-face -face communication, and the, I, I see, I personally see the paperwork as as just there for record purposes. Right, and so things like the uh, the BIM, the you know 360 design for and, and the model, are those helping communication? Uh, you know, is that does that make it easier to pinpoint exactly what it is that you're talking about and and why that needs to be changed? Because inevitably things change. You've got coordination changes or architectural or client changes. Does the model help that communication? Yes, I know absolutely. No, that's a very good point. So BIM and, and BIM 360, where we can communicate, has helped enormously, and that is a, a massive change in, in the time I've been working. Um, I don't know how we coped without it. <laughs> um, we said before we didn't know how we coped without CAD, but um, yeah, that really helps because there was a lot more reliance on contractors to take sort of a 2D design and and, and, and with the best will in the world, and we had amazing um, technicians in the in the MEP world, and we would pull out sections. But you, you've not got the whole picture. The, so often, exactly that has eliminated. It's, it's a lot more on, onus on the um, MEP consultants now and, and the design team um, that was previously um, put on the contractors. Um, so, but that, I think that very much has helped, and I, I think that's improved communication uh, a, a, a very great deal. Great. One last question around commissioning. So. You know, I've been commissioning buildings before and you kind of get to, to that 11th hour and the commissioning is happening, you know, the day before opening. Um, so what's important around commissioning that general contractors need to be aware of with the subcontractors? You know, is it about planning ahead? Is it, is it contingencies? Um, is it making sure you got all your test results earlier? You know, what works well for commissioning? No, I completely agree. It sort of goes back to the beginning of our conversation, Todd. Um, commissioning always, I mean, I did an amazing project for London School of Economics um, that back in, that completed in 2020 and the, the design team, the contractors were absolutely fantastic. But at the beginning it was like, we are going to make sure we have so much time for commissioning and every single time it falls over, time's delayed and the commissioning time gets shortened and shortened. And as an industry, we need to work on that because it's then, an, it's then a negative view of the MEP or the MEPs caused the delay, but it isn't, there just wasn't enough time to, to, to left to commission because the time got cut short off the programme. Got it. Well, Lucy, I want to thank you for your time. It's been great um, hearing your expert opinion uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have you on the show again soon. Great. I've been delighted to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. So if you want to see more of these types of educational series, don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time.